John 15 is uh, one of the most beloved chapters in the Word of God. It's very plain, very simple, very to the point, but it is so very important. So if you would, let me just kind of jump into it. If you would, uh, in honor of God's Word, would you just stand with us as we read a little bit of John chapter 15? Are you there? Say amen. amen. You're not there? Say wait. You're there. Let's go. I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser, the gardener. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples, as the Father loved me. Oh, how wonderful. I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, and you will abide in my love, just as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Matter of fact, he says, no longer do I call you servants for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my Father I have made known unto you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for this thing that we call church. I thank you that we are family in Christ. I thank you that we have opportunity every week to gather together where we can uh, see each other and greet each other and invest our lives into each other and encourage each other where we can sing your praises together we can worship together we can ensure encourage each other uh, in all the things that we as individuals do in our in the life that you've given us but we come together to bring glory and honor to you as a combined group called the church so lord speak as only you can now we come to your word we need to hear from you whisper may every heart Hear your voice. Father, of all the people that are here, there are probably different messages that need to be heard in our heart, but the one true God, the one Holy Spirit can take your word and apply it to our lives. Lord, we need that, and we ask for that today. I pray that you will bring the, the manna to our souls from your word today, that we will be drawn close to you. What a wonderful, wonderful gift that is. Bless as only you can. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I collect things that have no purpose. Anybody else do that? I collect things that have no absolute purpose whatsoever. Like ink pens. I collect ink pens. Don't ask me why. It just happens. I've got them all through the house. Matter of fact, I, uh, they gather together in coffee cups at my house. I've got them in my study, on my desk, on the shelves, in my bedroom. I've got three cups on my dresser. Coffee cups filled with 40, 50 ink pens. I don't know how I got so many of them. Now, don't get me wrong, I love a good ink pen. I love an ink pen that'll just fit in your hand just the right way, and it writes just the right way, and it just, everything comes out good. But there's nothing worse than having a dead ink pen. 
I mean, it just does nothing except sitting in the coffee cup, along with 50 more just like it, just waiting to be used. But when you reach for help, disappointment. Friday morning, I uh, grabbed my Bible and my pad and went to the living room, had my coffee in hand, looking out through the window. Oh, it was going to be a beautiful day. It was going to be a sunny day, I thought. Not so much. So I went to uh, begin to think about what I was going to say this morning and to, to write it down. So I went to the, one of the many coffee cups I have in my house, and I reached in to get a pen that I thought that's one of my favorites. And I went to the living room, and I began to read through the Word of God, and God began to say some things to me. So I pulled off the cap, and I began to write things down, and guess what? A dry hole. Why do we collect things with no purpose? I think pens go to die in coffee cups. I mean, we put them in there because we have so many of them and we think, I'll know where it's at, so I'll just go get one. But why is that? What's the probabilities of always pulling at the one that doesn't work? And then you get frustrated and you start to do this on a piece of paper and nothing comes out. Can I get a witness? And then you start to almost cry because you love that pen, though, there, though you have 75 just like it. And you think, but I wanted to use that pen today. And then you get up, this is what I did, and I went to the kitchen and I pushed the trash can lid and I threw it down and I said, you're over. And went to get another one just to repeat the process. Nothing is terrible as having a hope that's never fulfilled. We talked in Sunday school this morning about the hope that we have in Christ through the faith that we have in Him, through the grace that God abounds in us, that He comes to give us living hope. Hope in which we can rejoice. This is our salvation. This is God's greatest gift that God desires for us. He desires to give us of His very best. And He wants to give us everything that he has. And by the way, the very best, the perfect best, the ultimate best, the most exciting, the most wonderful, the most awesome thing that, that I will ever have, I will have forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And I will have joy. I will have peace. I will have love. I will not know disappointment. I will live my eternity with God putting his very best for me because he loves me and you. And he wants a relationship with us. That's why he allowed Jesus to leave heaven and come down here to earth and die the, the, the terrible death on the cross so that he could pay for the, the price of our salvation and we can be born again, made new, new life, and we're here to serve him, but one day, we will bow to this earth. We will be, I will be buried into this earth. I will breathe my last breath of this polluted air here, and I will breathe my first breath of the celestial glory of God. What a day that will be. But I don't have to wait till then to enjoy my Savior now. For whatever reason, God loves me and wants to enjoy me. Do you get that? He loves you. He knows you. If you're saved, He's forgiven you. And He wants to bless you. And I, that's God's side, but our side is, is that we get God. And we get to walk with Him and talk with Him and love Him. And He may say, hey, let's do some things today. Maybe He'll, my Father will grab me by the hands and say, let's go fishing. He may say, come on, I've, I've got a job I've got to do. Come with me and we'll work together. He may just look at me and say, come on, let's go have some fun. He may say, hey, there's somebody over there we need to go help. Let's go encourage them. He may just say, let's just rest. Let's just be together and enjoy being together. 
That's what dads do. Now, as a kid, you know, we're holding on to the hand of our father, and, and sometimes a kid wants to turn loose and run away. Sometimes he'll want to drag his dad to go do what he wants to do. And sometimes the father will follow us, and sometimes the father will say, no, 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 come with me. And sometimes us kids will have a fit. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Have y'all seen the stomp? I saw it in Kroger the other day. The kid gave the stomp, and then the tears rolled. And the screaming happened. And I'm thinking, if that was my child, they think they're at Six Flags because there would be a roller coaster ride up and down and up and down and up and down. Don't call children's services. My kids are grown. In John 15, he gives us the word and the picture of the vine. The vine. And it's very simple. It says, Jesus said, I'm the true vine. My father is the vine dresser, the gardener, the one who takes care of all of this that we live in. And you are the branch. There are three vines in Scripture. The first one we'll find in Isaiah chapter 5, and it speaks of Israel, God's chosen people. Of all the people, God called out a people unto himself that they could be a blessing to God and a blessing to the world as they would be the witness to the world of the goodness of God. But in Isaiah chapter 5, it says, verse 1, now let me sing to my well-beloved, that's what he called Israel, a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. What my well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up, cleaned out its stones, planted it with the choicest vine, built a tower in it, and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes. That's what he's talking about Israel. Of all the people, he planted them on a fruitful hill. He got rid of all the rocks. He gave it the most choice vine. He built a tower, a wine press. And, and it was all for the purpose of bringing forth good, grape, good grapes. But it says there in verse 2, but it brought forth bu'ushin, the Hebrew says. It's wild berries, sour grapes. Thayer's lexicon says stink berries. Now, I don't know what that is, and I really don't want to know what that is. It don't sound good at all. Rotten, dead. So he says in verse 3, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could, I, could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth bu'ushin? Wild, rotten, good-for-nothing berries. Now please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, it shall be burned. Break down its walls, it shall be trampled upon. I will lay it waste, it shall not be pruned or, or, or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. The children of Israel were given so much and they just wanted what they wanted. They didn't care about the glory of God. That's a sad, sad statement. The second vineyard that we'll see, the second vine that you'll see in Scripture, is alluded to here in, in chapter 15, but it's actually seen in its ultimate end in Revelation chapter 14. And there it's not speaking to Israel, it's speaking to those who had the, the, the possibilities, whether they were Jew or Gentile, those who had the possibilities, but they turned their back upon the Almighty God. It says... In verse 4, abide in me, this is John 15, verse 4, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Listen to verse 6, here it comes. If anyone does not abide in me, 
He is cast out as a branch, cut off, cast out, and is withered. And they will gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. That's the picture of Revelation 14. At the end of the days, the world will be gathered. The sheep and the goats will be separated. The sheep representing the children of God, the goats representing those who went their own way. Like the branch that was cut off and it withered and they gathered them and they were thrown into the fire and they burned up forever and ever and ever. That is an extremely sad note that is in John 15, which is one of the most encouraging. How is it that this happens? What occurs? They just wanted their own way. The Almighty wanted to bless, but they didn't receive the blessing. Then there is the third vine that Jesus is sharing here with his disciples. You know, he had to have a tinge of regret and feeling of hardship because he wanted everyone to follow him. He wanted everyone to feel the love of God. He wanted everyone to have that loving relationship, to be blessed and spend eternity in the greatest of the great where God would give all things to them, but he knew some would turn away. But he shares with them a very much words of love when he says, I'm the vine. My dad, our father, our heavenly father, he takes care of all of it. But if you're a believer, you are grafted into the vine. We are born again when we are grafted into the living vine. And we grow and we fulfill our purpose. <laughs> Let me say it again. We fulfill our destiny, our life, our purpose. He describes it. What's the purpose of the vine? To bring forth fruit. Not bu'ushin. No, 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 no. No sour berries. No, they, they will be cut off and cast into the fire. But good grapes. Look what it says here in verse number four. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. You can't do it on your own. Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. The word abide there is so wonderful. It, it literally means to tarry, to remain, to stay together. That's the, what he wants with us in a relationship. He says, let's tarry together. Let's remain together. Let's walk together. Let's work together. Let's be together. Enjoy the very best of all. That's what God wants from us. Every moment of every day, if you are a Christian, if you've been wise enough to give your heart and your life and your sins, if you've repented of them and you believe in Him and you trust Him, He will come and make you new. He will make you a child of the King. And every moment, He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. You are His. So remain. Terry. Let's abide together. Nothing worse than broken relationships. Nothing worse than estrangement. That's what Satan wants. He wants to divide and conquer. He wants to attack relationships. And the number one relationship that he's going to attack is our relationship with the Father. But he says... I have so much for you. Just like my ink pens. He made me to fit in his hand. And he'll reach out and take me to use me 
and to bless me. But when he picks up that pen, he doesn't want to find a dry hole. He wants one that's filled with the Holy Spirit. One that can be used for his purposes. And think about this. Everybody's got their own penmanship, right? It meets your style and fulfills the purpose. But I'm just the pen. He does all that for himself. What an honor. What a privilege. So he says, let's talk about this relationship of being one with each other. Look in verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Hold on. Is that correct? Is it, did I leave something out? Bears fruit? Is that what it says? Bears much fruit. The word is defined as many. Many, 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 many. Many, 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 many. It means large. It means healthy. Amen? Now, have y'all seen the, the, those pitiful little grapes? Have y'all seen those? When you're ready to pick one, is that the one you want? What's the one that you're looking for? I mean that big old large, plump, juicy, beautiful. Amen? And they come in clumps. What's, that's not the right word. What's the word? Clusters. Amen. I got a smart church, folks. You don't just get one. You can get a whole bunch. Amen? How many of you like a bunch? Overflowing. Right? Just so much. That's what God wants. Now, hold on. Let me say it again. He said, he who abides in me and I in him bears much, large, healthy fruit. But you can't do it on your own. Look what it says in verse 7. If you abide in me and my words, the words words means simply the things that come from his mouth. When Jesus is sharing it, he is sharing words with them. But listen, there's inflection. There's specificness to the definitions of the word. He's telling a story. There are truths that are there. And if we can listen to the words of God, the blessings of God, the truths of God. Look what he says. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. In the middle part of that says, and, and these words of mine, if they abide in you, you will. And in the English it says, ask what you desire. But that's only one word in the Greek. And it means... To beg. To share with passion. To crave. To desire. It can even be defined as to require when you ask. That's a privilege, folks. He's not holding back from us. He says, if you are with me and we are doing this together and the truths of my words are with me, with you, then, then the impulses that I've placed upon you, you can beg, you can ask, you can plead, and I will be there. I will bring it to fruition. Not my words, I'm abiding with him. Not my wants, because I know he's got the best for me. But when you do that, you can ask and believe. What does the Scripture say? Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. Do you think he's trying to keep back from us? No, he said, this is my desire. Because when I bless you, it will be fruitful. Large, fruitful, helpful. Christians, this is God's desire for us. It bothers me that I see so many Christians that have not found the fruit and the desire and the blessings of God, the hope that he has for you. There are Christians that are going through circumstances and hardships and pain, but God says, I will be with you. I will not forsake you. My hand of anointing, my blessing will be there. You may not understand it, 
but I have purposes and I have plans. I have wonderful things lined up for you. And the church will miss out because they're seeing it from what they receive other than the blessing of what God can give. But when you touch base with him and you're walking with him and, and he gives you these words, the still small voice of the Holy Spirit, the promises of God, he will make it abound. The church needs to abound. The church needs to quit doing it on its own. The church needs to walk by faith and not by sight. The church needs to seek into the love of God. Because if we will seek into the love of God, oh, what He can do. He says in verse 9, nine as the Father loved me. Folks, look up here. Do you really think that the Father loves Jesus? Can you say 100%? He cannot be in discord with Jesus. But Jesus is always in accord with the Father too. He says in the same way, don't miss this. As the Father loves me, I have also have loved you. Abide in my love. Remain in my love. Tarry in my love. I don't know if this blesses you, but the Father loves Jesus perfectly and Jesus loves the Father perfectly and the Father loves us through Jesus Christ. So we have the love in the relationship with the Father in Jesus Christ. Complete, total, all the time. We're just supposed to tear you there. So all of you who beat yourself up and say, God doesn't love me, God's not there for me, you just don't understand. God loves you completely. God wants the best for you completely. You just need to dive in and get all of it you can. Get all of it you can. It's like a buffet that just never, I mean, they're always bringing more of the best fruit out there for you. And, and you can define fruit in a thousand different ways, but it's just what you and God do together for his glory and for our benefit. He says, if you keep my commandments, these truths, and you abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love, these things I have spoken to you that my joy might remain in you. We've got an option here. We can follow our emotion or we can receive his joy. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Oh, what heaven's going to be like because we're all going to be loving each other. Oh, how hard it is to bear what we go through down here because we often only love those who love us. If anybody disagrees with us, we can just mark them off in our mind. We judge by our own standards. We tear down. And folks, this is among all of us. We look at another and we think they should be doing this, they should be doing no. Our Father who knows everything about us loves us completely. We don't know, have to know anything about all of us, but yet we get the great privilege. Y'all listen to love each other completely, holding nothing back. The thing that will change the church is the love of God. The thing that will change this community is the love of God. One of the great things that can happen in this church is all the love that's in this church. Not turn towards yourself, but turn towards those that God loves. The ministry of this church, when we don't look at each other, but we look at God and we receive the love of God and we share that love of God, oh, what God can do. In this lonely world that we live in, people are looking for love. They're looking for love in all the wrong places. They're looking through love for love for their own standards. And it's got an empty hole in the bottom of that pan. Jesus says, I have so much more. Look at verse 14. You are my friends. 
I could, it could literally say, if you just abide with me. But it, here, he is saying, if you walk it out, <clears throat> if you do whatever I command you. <clears throat> Verse 15, I no longer call you servants. That's a slave. Servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my Father by the power of the Holy Spirit I have made known to you. You didn't choose me. No, no. We, we chose sin. But when God called our voice, he said, I chose you and appointed you that you may go and bear fruit. And whatever, and, and, and that your fruit should remain and that tarry, that it will abide, that it will grow, that whatever you ask in my name, it may be given you. These things I have commanded you that you love one another. Now, church, we get mad at God because sometimes we have to go through things where he prunes us. My wife doesn't like pruning. She loves roses, so I planted her roses. We have fruit trees. Uh, last couple years, we, we didn't have any fruit on the trees. You know, cold came in, took all that out. But I noticed one thing this year. Oh, we had the fruit. We had the fruit. Broda said, better get rid of that. You have to knock some of that off. He said, get a plastic baseball bat. That's what you told me. So I went to five below. How many of you know five below? I went to five below and got me a plastic baseball bat. You know why? Because my dog chewed up the last one. <laughs> and I got me a, a handy dandy $5, well, it was $2, plastic baseball bat. And I went out there banging on the trees. And my wife said, look what you've done. Uh, by the way, it's her birthday. Y'all tell her you love her. You tell her happy birthday. She's years old. I'm not telling you that. <laughs> I want to stay happily married. Y'all just guess. It's older than 16 and less than 100. That's all I'm going to tell you. And she said, look at all of them down here. I said, yep. <sighs> and I said, honey, for them to mature, for them to grow up. I got plums. I got peaches. Mm, I got blueberries. I said, we have to, there has to be some pruning. There has to be. Henry Cloud is a Christian psychologist. It wrote a book called Necessary Endings. He says there has to be necessary endings so there can be new life. A lot of us don't like to prune. We want to keep our life just the way it is. God loves you too much to let you keep it just the way that it is. And there may be some things in our life that we have to prune back. He says, those that I love, I prune. Now, church, there's going to have to be some pruning. Why? Why? Because that's the Word of God. It's the truth of God. In uh, the end of last year, I always pick up a word for the coming year that I'm going to study all year long. Because there's, I'm not smart enough to get it all in one dose. I need a whole year to understand it. And for whatever reason, the Lord gave me the word trust. I was going to have to learn to trust in Him in 2024. Oh my is he had to teach me how to trust him. But you know, he's pretty good at it. He's pretty good at it. So in my life, there's been a lot of pruning in this year. And uh, I have offered up more pruning. I have told the Lord, you know, however long you want me here, I serve at your pleasure. I do what you would have me to do. You can cut me back to the stump if that's what you so choose. But I'm not going to argue and I'm not going to fuss because I know in my life there needed to be some necessary endings. I understand that. And I want to finish well. I was talking with a friend of mine this week and we were talking about stump, something and he, he, was, he brought up the word control and I said to him, control is an illusion. Those who people who think that they're in control, they're just fooling themselves. God's in control. 
And I'm not going to worry about those things. I'm, I'm not going to fret over those things. I'm going to trust the Lord. I'm going to be faithful to my day. I want to walk hand in hand with God wherever he so leads me. If he needs to sit me down and have a talk with me, that's for my best. I'm not going to be stubborn. I'm not going to stomp my feet. I'm not going to have a fit. I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to scream. I'm not going to try to run away. I'm going to say, thank you, my Father, for loving me the way that you have. Church, we must produce godly fruit. Fruit that remains throughout all of eternity. That's what the church is for. Israel produced bu'ushin, sour berries. We must not, we must not. Our Savior deserves so much more. I don't have all the answers. The only answer that I have is Jesus. And he will lead me. He will be the lamp into my feet, the light into my path. My responsibility is to tarry, to rest, to stay, not to run away from, but to remain in him, connected to the vine, so that the juice of the vine, the sap will flow, the power of the Holy Spirit will run out through the branches. The branch cannot do anything except be a tool that God uses to hang fruit. What we see as an ending, he sees as necessary so we could be better. Prune away, Lord. Are you willing to say that?